Welcome back to the PFC Podcast. The views and opinions you are about to hear are the speakers and do not necessarily reflect those of anyone else. Now on to the podcast. How we kind of dance between DA and UW and why we dance between DA and UW. How do we get to where we are today? And then the last part of this is now what? That's the golden hour. That's one of the ten ones. So if you want a copy of this, it's downloadable off the web. If you'll, if you'll just search for F-A-R-R and J-S-O-U, 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 Joint Special Operating Plan, press. Just search for FAR and J-S-O-U. It'll come up and go, would you like a download for free book of the Deathly Golden Hour? And, and you can get it. So those of you that need to rush your airplanes, they leave now. Download it and uh, study it at your leisure. Yeah, please do that and yeah, nothing happens. So that's my particular, I retired about five years ago. I'm corrupting medical students at a local university down in Tampa. And that's my email address down on the bottom. Fine again, talk about stuff. So. In 2003, we decided to do a series of ads about abortion. The Army, you know, doesn't like UW. The Army never knows what to do about UW, but they you know, would capitalize on the UW campaign that we had just had in Afghanistan in 2001. So they started coming out with these, these ads. Uh, Chief of Staff of the Army got upset because this guy wasn't in proper head gear. I always thought it was a great ad. So the Army also kind of had to explain UW. You know, all of a sudden we have UW campaign. We in the Northern Alliance, we're, you know, riding horses and doing cool stuff and taking over a country. And the Army kind of had to explain it. So this is part of the Army's explanation of what UW is. The Army's always had this idea that UW is actually kind of a side war for a bigger war. That we have a conventional war and then, oh, in the corner, you might have a little UW. So this is just the Army destination. Now, I, I tend to highlight things I want you to remember in red, so that's my comment in red there. Yet, you work you work along a force. But more, more better than that, this is this comment here. This takes a long time. Well, things take a long time. There's probably going to be a lot of medicine in it. It's because people get sick and it takes a long time. The UW, UW has to do medicine. Every time I'm not given my due by the cross arrow guys, I point out that 20% of special forces force structure is medical, right? 10 enlisted guys on the team, two medics, 20%. 20% is medicine. We want our time. So this is another one of those uh, ads, which is kind of the quintessential guerrilla warfare thing. We make soldiers, you know, you know, call for reinforcements. We make our own army. So I want to go through some examples of, of unconventional warfare back in the day. And this is one that a lot of people don't know about. This is the Germans in West Africa in World War I, von Lettau Vorbeck. Von Lettau Vorbeck was the German commander in World War I in, in German West Africa. And when the war started, he decided he was going to kick the British out of German West Africa and, and, and British West Africa, East Africa. East Africa. And, and he did. In fact, at the end of the war, the Kaiser called him and says, come home. And he said, why? We lost. Come home. And he did a, a very good warfare campaign. And that's that's his book, My Experiences in East Africa. So he did a lot of medical evacuation. This is some evacuation by him. So when you think about evacuation and the guerrilla warfare scenarios that we're going to talk about, be pretty expansive. Final I had trains to do evacuation with. So there's, there's all kinds of stuff out there. World War II was, had a lot of guerrilla warfare operational areas. This is a map out of the first field manual. I'll show you the cover of the manual in a minute. This is a map out of the first manual that shows all the areas that had guerrilla warfare. The little red arrow is about left out in World War I. But the black arrows are guerrilla warfare movements in World War II. Some of you probably know, and some of you don't. One of the interesting things is that the Poland, USSR, and Balkan stuff continued after World War II. Those resistance movements fought the Soviets in the 1950s. So there are certain areas in Eastern Europe, read the Balkan states, that have a long history of guerrilla warfare. It might be something that's going to come up lately. So this is a picture from the Yugoslavs for transporting casualties on horses. The Yugoslav senior surgeon wrote a book called Partisan Hospital of Yugoslavia. This is a hospital, this is a hospital that they had in that in Yugoslavia at the time. He wrote this book called Potter in the Hospitals of Yugoslavia that kind of lays it all out. This is taking wounded to a hospital blindfolded. You blindfold your wounded so they don't know where they're going. You take them to your gorilla hospital. So as the gorilla hospital got bigger, this is a comment from Dredge here about 
you have to have medicine in a partisan unit because you're asking for volunteers to come fight and die. Volunteers are going to come fight and die if you don't give them medical care. So it's just mandatory that you have a medical service of some kind in the gorilla for you. This is Dragic, and as, as the uh, for Tito's forces got here, Dragic and Tito asked for help. This is one of their hospitals. They had a lot of hospitals hid up in the uh, in snow cap. The Germans really run the road down the middle of the country. The Germans didn't really pay much attention to the mountain top. And so it was easy for the for the uh, Yugoslav partisans to kind of build in the hospitals way up in the mountains where the Germans could go. That's just an example of hospital. This is one of the wards uh, in one of the hospitals. So this is a couple of comments from Dragic. Casualties and wounded are a difficult problem, and you have to disperse them and pend them on the move. And he points out that a lot of times tactical plans get changed because you can't medically support them. You know, in our army, we try to medically support them. If we can't do it, you know, the lying guy tells us to do it. In Dragic's army, you know, the medics would literally win the day sometimes. But we can't attack that way because we can't support it. So as things got bigger, they put in a surgical team. They parachuted in a New Zealand surgical, three-man New Zealand surgical team to augment um, the Soviet, the, the partisan communist forces of Tito. So doctrinally, this is correct. If you look at the American doctor in its own table today, putting in a surgical team to do surgery on the locals in the guerrilla warfare is doctrinally correct. This is the comment from Lindsey Rogers, who was the, uh, the surgeon about well, Moving eastward, and he was moving with the Yugoslav hospital. And every fourth, moved every fourth night and carried all his injuries. The other team was a Canadian Army team. The guy who was setting the picture there, named Colin Defoe. He was the same thing, parachuted in and spent the rest of the war doing casualties. So I started kind of looking at guerrilla hospitals think, and, and, and forward surgical when forward, when forward surgical teams came up, and all of a sudden, you know, the GWAT's here, we've got four surgical teams, we all kind of. So, you know, SRSs and MFAS and FAST and all that other stuff, you know. I started kind of thinking about what, what does this mean? And I started thinking back to World War II and these things and, and the guerrilla hospital. It's got me, what's got me started writing a book. Of course, there's other stuff in World War II. I'm not going to tell you much more history. Uh, but one is the, an OSS team. The OSS team was jumping in, into China. And they cooked up with a big team that was fighting the Japanese. And the 18 Delta, they didn't call them 18 Delta, the OSS medic on that team found that the Vietnamese team leader was dying of malaria. And he ended up fixing the Vietnamese team leader who was dying of malaria. And then after the war, Aaron Bank, who was the father of American Special Forces, ended up picking up this same guy. And Aaron Bank actually rose from Hanoi to Saigon with Ho Chi Minh. Because the 18 Delta medic had saved Ho Chi Minh's life. Careful what you do. <laughs> so the, the holy trinity of special forces is Aaron Bank, Russell Volkman, and Wendell Fairchild. They're, they're all worth reading about someday when you, when you do things, but we're not going to talk too much about them today, except I have to talk about Faraday for a minute, because Faraday is a classic soft guy. You know, th this, is a, this is special forces guy par excellence. He's a reserve colonel mining engineer working for a mine team when the war starts. He orders himself to act with duty. Walks into the woods and becomes a guerrilla leader. He decides the guerrilla leaders need to be brigadiers, so he promotes himself to brigadier general and runs a, a guerrilla band in, in the Philippines for the rest of the war. My kind of guy. So they got those three guys together at the end of World War II, and they wrote a manual. The manual is FM 31-21, which is how to do guerrilla warfare. The best edition of this, which you find it on the Internet, is the 1961 edition. FM 31 next 21, 1961. It's got the most UW. The, UW. the amount of UW in the manual goes up, 61, and it goes down. And now they're trying to rewrite it now because they don't have any hardly in the doctrine anymore. Uh, but I pull that out regularly when I was on active duty because things that I needed were in the 61 manual. So I recommend that as a download of the web. They also made them rewrite this, which is operations against drill forces. So both those manuals came out in the early 50s. This also is the, believe it or not, the latest and greatest, December 1965. The latest and greatest book on auxiliaries. You don't have a guerrilla force if you don't have an underground and an auxiliary. Especially medically, if you're going to have patients and your guerrilla hospital is going to see patients, then you have to convalesce them somewhere. Where do you, where do you convalesce them? The auxiliary, the, the underground and the auxiliary of your guerrilla force 
takes those patients for convalescence. So having a good auxiliary is an important part of growth force. This is the other big take home message from all these manuals, and then we're going to move on from manuals. That things only work if special forces have a seat at the table at the theater level. So this shows a map of how a theater is supposed to be run. And it should be a, you know, an air guy, a Navy guy, an Army guy, and a soft guy. This was, this was written in 1951 as how you ought to have to be structured. It took until 1987 to enact, but in 1987, they put in the t- PSOC that gives us the seat at the table at the theater table so we can get stuff done. So I want to talk about medics. How do we end up with a kind of medic we've got in this, this, some, you know, some DA, some UW, some this, some that, say CP, all that stuff. So I want to go through kind of medics. So this, my introductory slide. So this Special Forces was formed in the 1950s. Groups grew up in Bragg in the 1950s. This is the 1950s weapon. What is it? The Davy Crockett. It's a nuclear weapon. It's, it's a kind of man portable, believe it or not. Put it on a Jeep. In about a five kilometer range, you can shoot the thing about five kilometers. The birth range was about five kilometers. So the joke was always you shot it, jumped in your Jeep, and drove the other way as fast as you could. So that was a that was the mindset in the 1950s. The special forces groups got stood up in the 1950s, and they had this whole thing of guerrilla war against the against the Russians. The Russians are going to move forward through the full of gap, and the Russians are going to be in France drinking wine before we can stop them. And so special forces is going to be behind the lines doing guerrilla warfare. And I was in dead A. Also known as the 39 Special Forces Captain in Berlin. And that's what we were supposed to do. We were going to be in Berlin, several hundred miles behind the front, you know, mucking with the Russian rear as the Russians, you know, went toward the most valley to find the wine. So the Army had some ideas about structure, and the Army would only give Aaron Bank X number of medics, depending on how many people he had, and only a battalion surgeon, you know, surgeon down to battalion level no longer or no lower. So the A team with the two medics is theoretically supposed to be able to raped the brigade of indigenous troops, and they would then run to the G hospital, and the battalion surgeon would be the commander of the G hospital. That was kind of the thought pattern that started medicine, that started medicine. So 1960 and the Vietnam come. So everybody goes to Vietnam, and the medical course was part of Fort Sam and part of Fort Bragg. And Fort Sam thought all the conventional stuff, and then came to Fort Bragg, and he got all kind of unconventional stuff. He ended up with that MOS that came about it. MOS when I was the busy guy early in the game. So in the 70s, things fell on hard times. Everybody came back from Vietnam. All the medics that went to Vietnam wanted to come back and be something. And they came back and found out they couldn't be anything. Nurses wouldn't even let them have your bedpans. So they all looked around for something to do and started figuring out PA was the answer. So the whole the whole PA school phenomenon started really off the the SF medics from Vietnam said, I, I know I can do more. I, I acted like a doctor in Vietnam. You're trying to act me like, you're trying to get me to act like a corpsman or a, you know, an orderly now, so I want to do something else. SF got downsized an awful lot because we lost the war by fault of Vietnam, the way it went. So the only thing that was a growth industry at that time was direct action with counter terror. The unit I was in, which is clearly a they stay behind urban guerrilla warfare unit, morphed into a counter terrorism unit. We, we got, we, we became the first counter terrorist unit before that one that talked about in Fort Bragg all the time. Because that was the growth industry, the Bader Meinhof gang, and, you know, they didn't have airplanes and all that kind of stuff. So <laughs> there was a dramatic shift to direct action. The medics were going to do direct action. It came, Jimmy Carter left, thank God. The Iran hostage rescue didn't go very well. And, and for some reason in the, in the 80s, the military got off uh, got off on a kick about cards and giving everybody a screen card. So ATLS showed up, and EMTP showed up, and all of those civilian certifications showed up. Uh, and then everybody wanted into courts. And so we've got a, we've got a kind of a direct action door team medic course. <clears throat> and then everybody who's asking to come is a direct action door kitchen kind of guy. Seniors want to see and send their medics. Everybody wants to send their medics. So the 90s come, 90s start with you know, Deadly Storm 1 and kind of end with T Triple C. So in the 90s, there's still this thing about credentials. Every, 
uh, ATLS. Remember ATLS, too large for IV to see color? Yeah, it's a great thing for doing battlefield. And the ABC, A, A, A B, and Air, first life and saving step is airway. I was at that point going, the first life saving step is shoot back. So we at least got the course move to brag. Uh, but it didn't have, again, it didn't have the guerrilla warfare side of the house. It just had that door kicking CT stuff. And as people got more and more dissatisfied with ATLS, everybody sat down after the more issue and this little after action report and started talking about what ultimately turned into the TCC. So the 2000s came, the war came. School had gotten, I, I'd gotten there to brag, in fact, and we refocused the school a little bit. We did more surgery. Uh, and if you do more surgery, you do more, more nursing. You do more medicine because you've done more surgery. Uh, and then the war starts. What, what kind of war, what kind of medic do we need when the war starts? A gorilla medic. We're running around with a gorilla force doing, you know, running, riding horses and, and working with the Northern Alliance. And all of a sudden somebody needs a surgical team. And so all of a sudden we're back to, we're back to our roots, back to our roots of the real war. And, you know, surgical teams end up supporting real war. See how long that lasts. Three months, maybe. One month, you know, all of a sudden. Tenth Mountain comes in, that's up the way. And we're back to door picking combat action medics again. So that started the war of the Golden Hour. So Golden Hour is a wonderful thing if you can support it. And in Afghanistan and Iraq, we can support it. Now, we couldn't support it in Afghanistan until the Secretary of Defense said, you will. You know, we were supporting it in Iraq. Iraq had 60-minute service. But Afghanistan had 90-minute service. Secretary of Defense one day got a briefing on that and went, no, no, that's not going to happen. That needs to be 62. I can recognize the political nightmare when I see one. Uh, that needs to be 62. So all of a sudden, we had 60-minute 60, 60 circles in, in Afghanistan. But either way, we're spoiled. Nothing, nothing wrong with being spoiled. Nothing wrong with providing wonderful care within 60 minutes to people. It's great. It's a great goal. But then I started getting guys that were calling me from Rwanda going, Doc, we were, we we're doing this mission in Rwanda. How do I, how do I have my golden out? I got to have it. They tell me I got to have it. No, you don't have to have it. Can't do it. So that's what got me thinking about the death of the golden out. So, as he said there, the SecDef, SecDef mandate. Uh, a shout out to AFSOC and the Air Force. I never really say nice things about the Air Force. But I will say, the Earl of Fon, P.K. Carlton and Darla Fon and the cast of thousands came up with their soft teas. And, and there was no reason for the Air Force to do that. The Air Force wasn't taking huge casualties on the battlefield. They did it for the good of sauce. They said, we need this. And all of a sudden, we had these wonderful teams that I used to death that were that allowed us to do golden hours, right? You put that team down, you've got your golden hour right there. So shout out to the Air Force. So golden hour. Everybody knows what the golden hour is. This is the comment from you know, Russ Collimo's paper. And Russ went back and looked at casualties in Afghanistan before and after the golden hour. So he looked at casualties under the golden 90 minutes, and then he looked at casualties in the golden hour. And golden hour more better. Yeah, fine, got it. You know, if we can do it, it's a wonderful thing. So the war continues on, of course. And all of a sudden, we're, we're elsewhere. What does elsewhere mean? Well, elsewhere means that 12-man SF team may be the only thing in the country. Way to everywhere. Long evacuation time. There's no golden hour. What are you going to do? One of the things is, we've always said that 18 deltas and SOCOMs can hold a patient for 72 hours. So all of a sudden, prolonged field care. That's one of the things we can do. And that we start reevaluating the third world. You know, not all third world surgeons are bad. Half of them are trained in London anyway. Third world nurses tend to be bad. Primarily third world nurses are bad because they go home at night and don't leave anybody covering the board. The third world doctors may be who you end up taking somebody to. You don't have your pulling out. So as you go into the, this is a screenshot from the SOCOM thing. Where are we? You know, where's Waldo? You know, we're everywhere. So I submit that in the 2020s, in the next decade, we're going to be looking back to our roots, meaning the only presence in the country is going to be a 12-man 18 with two medics, no doctor. It's going to be a long way to surgery, which makes you think about local care or bringing in a forward surgery team. 
the problem with bringing in a forward surgical team is it's not going to be that much trauma. I mean, if, when you have a trauma case, it's going to ruin your day and, and, and it's going to be really busy for a while. But how are you going to keep a forward, forward surgical team con constant, you know, trained for a casual that may only happen for six months? I started having that problem in the Middle East with the soft tea. I took my soft tea and sent them to Afghanistan to keep them busy when I didn't need them for my other uh, theater missions. So there's not enough security in the world to make enough surgical team. If you even could make enough surgical team, they would expire. So you got long evacuation times coming, more medicine, because again, you're not going to see that much trauma. You're going to see medicine. I mean, it's like guerrilla warfare again. You're going to see a lot more medicine than you're going to see trauma. Uh, and you're going to end up going back to the real hospital way of doing business. So I look at the way of the way ahead, and, and this is my laundry list. I have two slides in the way that P triple C is there. T triple C is good. Everybody understands that commanders need to understand they own it. The Rangers have been the best about that. It's a battle drill. It's not a medical drill. It's a battle drill. Uh, and all the schoolhouse in the T triple C. We're still working through that. Monty will get up here and talk about people see a couple of lectures after me. Uh, so we're finally getting all the schools on board that they really need to do this. Uh, we, we, we clearly need to be able to field medical things faster than we are. That's an RF quick building. The FDA is now starting to get cooperative. We're actually talking with the FDA where the FDA may give us the ability to use the drug, even though it's not fully FDA approved in the battlefield only. So we finally made some progress. They made the FDA understand what kind of Kind of okay. Non standard med law. Sterile doesn't mean sterile like boiled. Sterile means like non, non US. Right now, I, it's very hard to obtain medical supplies that aren't US marked. So if I would really wanted to go into a third world country with sterile supplies, that's really hard to do. That, that code is getting cracked. There's what's called a non standard logistics course now being taught down to the JSON, which talks about that kind of stuff. But that's another area we need, to, we need to look at. And reinvigoration of UW training and, and, and soft. SF has been as bad as anybody else about not doing and not teaching UW. We've got to get back to that. And those that are not going to do UW still need some training because the enablers, medics, aviators, that come in and support it through the World Warfare Mission are going to need some training to alter them. We're already on this aggressive hunt for new technologies. I think we really need to question the old medical normals. There is no study out there that says the oxygen is a requirement. Now, how much trouble we have carrying big, lucky green tubes of oxygen around. There's no study that says oxygen makes a difference. Even in cardiac, even heart attack, there's no study for oxygen. So we spend, there, spend millions trying to do oxygen generation and all that stuff. So we need to question a lot of that kind of stuff. And I put forth that SOF must have an organic search capability team just like it had in World War II. We, we did grill work in World War II. As, our, as the grill teams got bigger, we got to grill a hospital. As the real hospital gets bigger, they're going to need surgeons. Where are you going to get the surgeons? Well, if you're, if you're fortunate, if you're running a guerrilla warfare in a really neat country with a lot of higher education, then you got enough surgeons. But if you're running somewhere where they're dumb, then the American or other allied forward surgeon team may be what you need to bring in. Um, now we've got that. The soft teeth is a good example. I'm going to say, I'm going to, I'm going to run a guerrilla warfare. So I'm going to go to, I don't know, some country. And I'm going to jump in and I always say definition of guerrilla warfare, SF team, 12 men team jumps in the country five years later, rides into the national capital away with a new flag. So we're, we're, we're doing, we're on that campaign, you know. And so I need a forward surgical team. So I get a forward surgical team to jump in, find F4 SOS team, and they're going to start doing surgery at the guerrilla hospital. And we're doing indigenous at the guerrilla hospital. We're also doing Americans. Before, but we used to evacuate America out rather than send them to the auxiliary or for, for rehab. So the first thing they do is uh, a femur. And so they do external fixation and they put a big, bright, shiny uh, green plastic cast on it. And then the guy give this guy two bright, shiny aluminum crutches and they tell him to go to go over to that, you know, the big tree in the corner way over there and the auxiliary will pick him up and, you know, take him to some village where he's going to recuperate. On the left, the, the underground. How far do you think he's going to get dressed like that? Before the secret police comes up and goes, What? We never saw a cast that was green. We never saw crutches that were shiny and aluminum. 
but we can really reconsider what kind of medicine we're taking for valve. Maybe we don't really want to take all that first world medicine. Maybe we need to take third world medicine. Third world surgical team, not the first world surgical team. So what are you going to do? Well, you're out in this country and you're only get trauma once, once, in, a, once in, a, in a while. You're busy doing medicine every day. You do prolonged field care is the first thing you do because evacuation is going to be so long if you're going to have to do prolonged field care. That's just a given. So it's good good on the prolonged field care working group. It's, it's doing all that stuff and go on. At 18 Delta has a repertoire of surgical procedures that he's authorized to do. And there have been cases in the past where 18 Delta has done surgical cases that they weren't authorized to do. They can out spleen so. There's conventional evacuation, which may be, just happens to be close enough to be able to do that. There's unconventional evacuation. Local care. Again, local doctors aren't all bad, especially if they're working in your gorilla hospital. You vetted them already. So it may be that, uh, that that's the answer. You may have a forward surgical team that's not too far away. If you've got a whole bunch of A teams around doing guerrilla warfare. Most successful guerrilla warfare operations have some kind of a sanctuary next door, a neutral country that they can hide in. Maybe you've hidden one of your forward surgical teams in a sanctuary country and you can get over that. That's what, that's what the Afghans did in their first war, which go over Italian past with the Red Cross hospitals and packs. So, yeah, you may put all these together and do, do all of them. Um, so I submit that GWAT, the time between 2001 and 2000 and now, was a high noon in the 100-year war. We've had our high noon. We've had the luxury of the golden hour. Life was good. You didn't know how good it was. Life was good, but life is over. And we're going to go back to the 100 years war. We've got to fight completely differently. Final quote, the esteemed author and publisher and historian and retired colonel. You can't always bring the medical. And in fact, I submit you shouldn't bring the medical clinic to the outfit. Try to make the GG happen. Much more important. I'm open for your questions. Thank you. That's it for today's podcast. Be sure to go to our website, www.prolongfieldcare.org. Find us on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram. Subscribe and stay on the bleeding edge of combat medicine. This is Dennis for the PFC Podcast. Out.